What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Module 2, mo sorry, Algebra 2, Module 1, Topic 1, Test Review. Oh, you're gonna make an arrow? Wait, that's kind of sick. Uh, I'm not recording this on my normal setup, I'm doing this at school, so my mic isn't as good as it normally is, but if you're in my Algebra 2 class this year, this is my first video watch, so you have no other frame of reference. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through the review, I'm gonna do all the problems, and then maybe on the side, I think I'm going to leave a little space for like, uh, you know, good note card things. Because you can't have this review as notes on the test, but I am letting you make a note card. Uh, and so maybe some stuff that, you know, you, you, you might be incentivized to write down on your note card. Things that I think will be important for you to remember. Uh, and things that I want you to just, you know, not necessarily have memorized, but just should know. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's just go into it. Uh, we're looking at the first three questions here, and they're all kind of similar. All the questions are the same within them, but the big difference is that they're all in three different forms of the quadratic equation. And so the first thing that you might want to write on your note card are the three forms of the quadratic equation, but I'll kind of go through each of them in these questions. So the first one, which is not the first one we talked about in class, but the first one on the, the review, is this bad boy right here. And this one is in vertex form. And the reason we know that is kind of just by looking at it uh, and mainly looking at the fact that I have something in parentheses being squared and then this x has something being done to it, right? This minus 3 is happening inside the parentheses. That's going to help hint to us that the vertex is being given to us. Uh, and then there's a number on the outside and then a number here as well, okay? Uh, I'm going to answer these questions and then kind of go through maybe the notes. That way, if you want to skip ahead, you can skip ahead to just uh, looking at the note, like what things you should put on your note card. So this one's in vertex form. The way to determine if it's concave up or concave down is by looking at the leading coefficient. That's the A value at the beginning. If it's positive, then we're concave up. If it's negative, we're concave down. Since this is negative, that means we are concave down, which is like a frown like this, like a frown. I wonder if I do that will it give me a parabola oh it gave me a heart oh what's the axis of symmetry well in vertex form it's not too bad to figure out uh the way that i always sort of remember that what i'm getting at with the axis of symmetry is that you know i'm finding the middle of this parabola that's the axis of symmetry uh and if i know the vertex because it's in vertex form well i know where the center of this parabola is at because the vertex is always at the center as well and it's on the axis of symmetry it's just going to be the x value inside my vertex form equation and so if i look at here this sort of parenthesis area is going to tell me what the x value of the the vertex is at it says x minus three but in our normal form of the quadratic uh in vertex form Oops, I don't know why I wrote seven, which is this. The h is already being subtracted, and that's the value we want to find. It's at x equals h. And since in this case, the minus three is happening here, that means that h is actually positive three. Uh, and so the, the axis symmetry is going to be at three. There's a few reasons. I mean, we, we talked about in class why it's flipped. Um, but really, the, a couple ways to think about it is if you want to take it outside of the parentheses, you're going to have to flip it. I mean, that's kind of it, but not really. But really, the thing that matters is that it's the value of x that we're going to plug in to this parentheses uh, that makes it 0. And so that's what ends up being this. This is the value of x that makes the inside of the parentheses be 0, which matters the axis symmetry here. And then the vertex is also easy to find. Uh, I wrote the form up for a second and then erased it. But the vertex is going to be a combination of the axis of symmetry. That's the x-coordinate, as well as uh the final coordinate oh my gosh i flew up this coordinate right here is going to be the y coordinate that's the k value as we call it or the vertical displacement and so it's three comma seven for the y intercept this one's a little trickier uh we just want to plug in when x is zero because if i'm imagining a graph no matter what this graph looks like i can find the y intercept as long as i know the value of y when x is zero that's just what it means to be on the y-axis. And so I'm going to take my equation and plug in x equals 0. So I get negative 2 times 0 minus 3 squared plus 7. There's some PEMDAS to do here. Uh, I got to do the inside the parentheses, but it's really just 0 minus 3. So I end up, get a, I end up getting negative 2 times 3 squared, negative 3 squared plus 7. Uh, and then I got to do exponents. 
And so that's going to become this. Uh, negative 2 times 9, because that's negative 3 squared. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9, plus 7. Uh, and then I just have to multiply this out. So negative 2 times 9 is negative 18, plus 7, which in total is negative 11. And so the vertex is going to be at 3, sorry, the y-intercept is going to be at 0, comma, negative 11. That's my answer. I plugged in 0, and I evaluated. That's all I did. Okay, let's go on to the next one, the standard form. This one is the one maybe we've talked about the most, and, and we've done a lot of stuff with it. So this one is in standard form, and I know that because it's in this sort of x squared minus something x plus something. It has all the terms in it. It has three terms. It can be in standard form without three terms. The x squared has to be there, though, and there's nothing else. There's no parentheses. Normally, we don't have parentheses in standard form, so that's a good way to... Uh, to know that you're in standard form. This one, the a value is always in front of x squared. So it's the thing that's multiplying the leading term. So it's the leading coefficient. And uh, it's positive, so it's going to be concave up this time. Like a cup. Like a cup. The axis of symmetry for standard form, you got to know this one. It's kind of just a formula, so maybe this is the first thing that we'll say for good note card things. The axis of symmetry is always at x equals negative b over 2a, with a and b being the, leading, the coefficients of each of these terms. This leading term is a, this middle term is b, and this last term is c. Uh, since we need to make b negative in our little formula here for finding the axis of symmetry, but in my equation, it's already negative 6. That means when I go to plug it in, I'm going to get negative negative 6 over 2 times 4. That's going to be 6 over 8, which is uh, 3 fourths. Okay, that's a nice fraction. And then to find the vertex, we're going to take that point and plug it into our function and solve for y. Uh, and so here's what we're going to get. We're going to plug in Every time I see an x, I'm going to replace it with 3 fourths because my axis symmetry is at x equals 3 fourths. Uh, and so I'm going to get 4 times 3 fourths squared. Man, who made this problem? Holy moly. Minus 6 times 3 fourths plus 5. Oh, God. Oh, these aren't even going to be nice. Okay. Well, that's okay. Fractions never hurt anybody. Uh, here we go. So... I'm just going to see if I can do it without a calculator. You can double check me if you want to use a calculator. Uh, but I'm going to do the squared things first. So take care of this exponent. 3 squared is 9 over 4 squared is 16, um, which also is reducible to 3, 4. Wait, what am I, what am I, what, wait, what, wait, 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 what am I doing here? What am I, what am wait. Oh, it's not reducible. Never mind. I don't know what I'm thinking. Minus 6 times 3 fourths plus 5. Okay, here we go, fraction mode. Then if you're multiplying numbers to fractions, you can just multiply the tops, right? By the way, completely acceptable to just type this into your calculator and find the answer. In fact, please do that, but I'm challenging myself for some reason. 4 times 9 is 36 over 16 minus 6 times 3 is 18 over 4 plus 5. Let us put all of these in terms of something over 4 so we can combine them because this can be reduced. So 16, 36 over 16 is uh, 9 fourths. And then um, this is minus 18 fourths plus 20 fourths. Okay, we're almost done. We're almost done. Any fractioners? Any fraction people? 9 minus 18 is minus 9, plus 20 is 11. 11 over 4. I think that's our answer. And so the vertex is going to be at 3 fourths, comma, 11 fourths. Should I check it? Okay, let me check it real quick. Let me load up Desmos on the other computer. Let me just see. Now, when it comes to doing the test, you have to show me some amount of this work. Plugging it in and finding the value of it is great. You don't have to do all these steps. I don't want you to just graph it and tell me the answer, though, like I'm going to do right now. Uh, 4x squared minus 6x plus 5. Looks like it's at 
three fourths and 2.75, 2.75, 11 fourths. Let's go. Okay, and then the y intercept is really easy to find. Uh, that one is the superpower of standard form, I would say. And it's just the c value. And so it's going to be at 0, 5, because c is 5. Uh, and that's what happens if I plug in x equals 0. I'm just going to get 5. Okay. Last but not least, let's do factored form. This one is factored form. You know it because it has two sets of parentheses, x plus something, x minus something, something like that. Graph is concave down because that's negative. Uh, that's like a frown, by the way. And I'm going to write that every time. The axis of symmetry for this one, another formula that you kind of remember, these two things uh, are the roots of the equation, or the x-intercepts, kind of. Really, they're the values next to x. We have to figure out uh, what values of x make my equation 0, kind of like applying the zero product property. Because in our normal equation, it looks like this. You have a, and then it's x minus r1 times x minus r2. Uh, and r1 and r2 are kind of these numbers, but notice that because of this minus sign in my like sort of written out you know variable form, uh, I have to flip the signs in my head. And so because of this, r1 is actually going to be negative 2, and r2 is going to be positive 7, even though in the equation they kind of appear different. Then when you go to solve for the axis of symmetry, because I know the two roots of this equation, like if these are my x-intercepts, to find the axis, all you have to do is find what number is directly in between those two roots, which is using the midpoint formula, uh, or the average between two points. And so I'm just going to take those two points, add them up, and then divide by 2, which means I get negative 2 plus 7 over 2, which means I get 5 over 2. Just great. Like I love fractions so much. I'm so glad that uh, there's another one that we have to deal with here. Uh, and then to find the vertex, similarly to the, uh, and that's x equals, similar to the last one, we're going to plug that value in for x into our equation and solve. This is going to be more annoying. We'll see if we can do it. All right, so I'm going to plug in 5 halves every time I see an x. So 5 halves plus 2 times 5 halves minus 7. Uh, okay, well... We can both put we can put these over too. Let's do some fraction work. Let's 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 really let's get our hands dirty here. Four over two is the same as two, and then five over two minus fourteen over two. Okay, so then it's negative nine halves times negative nine halves. Wait a second. Wait a second. What's going on here? Then when you go to multiply fractions. I'm going to get a negative sign on the outside, and then 9 times 9 is 81 over 2. Wait. Wait, hold on. What I, where did I go wrong? Is this right? Let me check it. By the way, don't do what I'm doing. I'm just plugging into Desmos. Don't do that. It doesn't help you in life. You really got to learn how to use your fractions like I'm doing. Wait, I'm right. Wait, holy moly. It's at 20.25. Oh, you got to multiply the bottom. 81 over 4. <gasps> Yo, 80, negative 81 over 4, which is negative. No. It's negative negative because these two multiply to a negative, and then there's a negative out front. Negative times a negative is a positive. That's positive 81 over 4. That's irreducible. Or 20.25. That's the same thing. Uh, and so my vertex is at... 5 halves, comma, 81 over 4. See, that's not so bad. Come on, it's just a little fraction. It's just a little fraction. If these were just regular old numbers, you guys would be happy, you know what I mean? But because they put a little line here, all of a sudden we start freaking out. We start freaking out. It's all good. Uh, why intercept? We're going to plug in 0 again. Uh, this one doesn't have a superpower of that. So I'm going to plug in 0 uh, for x and solve. This one's not so bad either. We end up with negative 2 times negative 7. That's positive 14. And so my y-intercept is going to be at 0, 14. Make sure to write it as a coordinate point. I'll box my answers here. And then the x-intercepts of the function, well, you kind of already had to figure them out to do the axis of symmetry. They're going to be the r1 and r2 values kind of after you flip it, right? After you do the... Uh, 
the change in your head about making them positive or negative. And so the x-intercepts are going to be at these two values, negative 2, comma, 0, and 7, comma, 0. And that's from the R1 and R2 values. That's the superpower of this one, okay? Okay, so from that, good note card things would be to go back through your notes. And we've done it like three or four times. I told you that we're going to do it a lot in this class. Find your notes on the three forms and their key characteristics. Characteristics. Really nice handwriting there. Um, by the way, if you're watching this and you're kind of just doing the problems along with me, that's great, that's helpful. Uh, it's good to get a refresher on the types of problems you might see on the test. However, I think the best course of action is to not put these examples on a note card, but instead just to put definitions and stuff that you need to remember on the note card and then just practice it on your own and see if you can uh, you can do problems without even needing that guidance, okay? So for this one, this is where we have a missing A value. So this is the one where I give you some facts about this uh, parabola, about this equation, but there's no A value to be found. And so you have to kind of do a little bit of detective work to figure out what the correct A value actually is. And so if we look at um, the way that I set it up, I actually give you two different ways that you can go about it. You can use the x-intercepts as a guide to sort of fill out most of your equation, or you can use the vertex, right? And the idea is that you're going to use one of these two forms, either the factored form, which tells us about the x-intercepts, or the vertex form, which tells us about the vertex, and then use our extra point, like a, a point that this graph exists, to figure out an, the A value that makes it true. Okay, you can choose which one you think is easiest. I think I like the x-intercepts one. Just makes more sense to me, but I'm going to do both. And so if I do it the factored form way, form way, that means I'm going to set up my equation like this. f of x equals, I don't know a because we weren't given it, but I do know that the rest of our equation has x-intercepts at negative 5, meaning my x minus r1 is going to be x minus negative 5 which is really x plus 5. And then it has a x intercept at positive 1. That means I have x minus 1 in my equation. Okay, And so I'm almost set up. I just need to find the a value. And so what I need to use is this extra point that exists on the graph, this 2 comma 21. I know that when I plug in this value of x, when I plug in 2 for x, the output or my y value should be 21. Well, the output of this function is f of x. It's the whole left side, right? We often interchange y and f and f of x all the time. And so if you want to, you can write it as y equals instead. That might help you. But I'm going to plug in 2 comma 21 with 2 being an x value and 21 being a y value and then solve for a. Right, solve for a, because that's the only thing that's going to be missing after I plug in these numbers. Here's what that's going to look like. This is my y value, which is 21. So 21 equals, I still don't know a, so I'm going to leave it. But now every time I see an x, I'm going to write 2, because that's what I'm substituting it with. So 2 plus 5 times 2 minus 1. Okay. And now the, all this has is one variable, which means I can solve it. And so I just need to do a little bit of work, a little bit of multiplication, maybe some division, and see if we can get there, okay? And so let's handle this parentheses things, P for PEMDAS. Uh, you got to excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Please do that. 7 times 1, I did 2 plus 5, 2 minus 1. Well, that's just 21 equals A times 7, which is the same as 21 equals 7A. To get a by itself to find the correct value, you just divide by 7, right? That's what's stopping a from being by itself. Those sort of cancel, leave you with 1a equals 21 divided by 7 is 3. And so my correct answer in factored form is just this equation, but with an a value of 3. So it's going to be f of x equals 3 times x plus 5 times x minus 1. That's my final answer. Okay. If you wanted to do it the vertex way, I'll set it up for you. You're going to find the same A value. It's going to work every time. Um, and so here we go. The, the vertex form, you're going to have to use the vertex point. 
which looks like this. It's at uh, two comma twenty one, right? No, twenty seven, negative twenty seven, negative two comma negative twenty seven. Uh, and so it's going to look like f of x equals, don't know a, but I know x minus h. So x minus negative 2, that's actually plus 2, and that's squared, and then minus 27 on the end. Then you plug in 21 in for y, or f of x. You plug in 2 for x minus 27, and then you solve. Looks like you'll end up getting uh, you know, 21 equals 4a, no, 16a. And then you have to add 27 to both sides and divide by 16, and I think you get 3. So it should work out both ways. Okay, so then this would be dot, dot, dot. And then you could solve it, rewrite this when you find the a value. All right, these ones are fun. I like these ones a lot. Because this one tricks your brain a little bit. You have to think deeper about these ones, okay? And so, what I want for you to uh, answer on question five is to say whether or not this equation could potentially model this graph. Now notice there's no blank, or the axes are blank, there's no labels or anything, which means that these numbers could literally be anything you want as long as this side is all positive, this side is all negative in terms of x, and then the same thing is true in terms of y, right? And so we're gonna use the key features of the graph to understand and, and compare them with the equation to figure out if it could model it, okay? And so the things that we're gonna look for in our equations, number one, that we can determine from a graph just by looking at it is the concavity. That has to match, right? Uh, number two, we can know the y-intercepts for sure. That's a, a easy to find in all of our different equations. Uh, I said ints, but there's only ever gonna be one y-intercepts. We could find the x-intercepts if we we're really going crazy. And in addition to that, we could find the axis of symmetry, okay? And so let's look here. Now, it's kind of a rule of math that if you want to prove something, if you want to prove that something is true, you have to prove that it's true for all cases, for every single facet of that problem. To prove that it's false, you only have to prove that it's false once, right? Because if it doesn't work for one thing, then it certainly won't work for everything. And so, in these, if I want to say yes, I have to go through all of the different things. If I want to say no, I have to explain why, okay? So let's check the concavity. So far for this one, 3x squared plus 6x minus 2, the concavity works. It should be concave up, and so that's a check. So concavity for this one is good, okay? The y-intercept I know is negative 2. I have no idea what this number is, but I do know it's negative, and so honestly, that's all I can say. It's a check. Then the x-intercepts. I could go out and factor this out, but maybe we'll save some time and, in fact, use the axis of symmetry, okay? And so on standard form ones, I think the axis of symmetry will actually give us enough of a hint. And so let's figure out this axis of symmetry using negative b over 2a. So I know that because of this, negative b over 2a will be uh, negative 6 over 2 times 3, uh, which is negative 6 over 6 which is negative one. That's the axis of symmetry. Now, once again, there's no scales on this graph. However, I notice that the middle of this parabola is on the left side of my x-axis, which is negative, and so it could work. So I'm gonna give it a check. And so I'm gonna say yes, because everything fits. Uh, if the axis of symmetry is in the middle at this point, then probably the two x-intercepts are on that side as well. And so I think this one's gonna work. Uh, because the concavity matches is up, I'll say. The uh, y-intercept is negative, which is what we needed to check. And the axis of symmetry is negative as well. And that's what I need to check. Those all work, and so I'm going to say yes. Now when we get to g of x, this one, we'll kind of do the same thing. We'll work our way down. Concavity, check. It's positive, so that's good. Y-intercept, we could plug in, zero, but we're in factored form. So let's use the superpower of factored form, which is the x-intercepts to see if this is true. And I noticed that there's something weird going on with this equation. The x-intercepts have the same sign, right? It's x plus four and x minus three. That means the x-intercepts are actually at x equals negative four 
and x equals negative 3. But if I look at my graph, surely one of these x-intercepts is not negative. It's on the right side of the y-axis. It's on the positive side of the x-axis. And so I just need to prove one thing. This is no because uh, in my equation, in my equation, both x ints are negative, but the graph isn't, or doesn't have those, or I don't know. Both the x-intercepts and the graph are not, both negative. One's positive and one negative. I could say, but the graph has one positive and one negative, something like that. Okay. Prove that it's wrong. So it doesn't work. Okay. So you can do these with any form. You just kind of have to match up the key features with the graph. I think they're kind of fun. They're like a little proof. Okay. We only have one more page to do. These problems are a little bit easy. I think I might skip one or two of them, but I'll show a completing the square problem right here. Okay. So completing the square the whole goal with completing the square when solving quadratics uh, is that we want to figure out how to turn the left side of this equation into something that we can solve, okay, by doing things to both sides, kind of like we're classically solving an algebra problem. And so the goal is that we want to turn the left side into a perfect square trinomial. That means our left side should be able to be written like this. If I have two numbers that can be anything, a plus B, and then I square them. Well, what happens when I square this out is I get this. You have to sort of double distribute, right? You're like squaring everything. So you're not freshman dreaming it. Uh, instead, you're going to get A squared because you'll end up doing A times A. But then remember, if you're like multiplying out two binomials like this, you have to do A times B and then A times B again, which in total is plus 2AB, right? It's two times these two things, right? If I multiplied it out like this, I'd get A times A, and then I have to do B times A and A times B, which is 2AB. And then the last thing you get is plus B squared at the end, okay? And so my goal is I want to write the left side of the equation like this so that I could just take the square root of both sides to solve it, all right? So we have to check if our equation is in this form, which... It's currently not, and here's why. 74 is not a perfect square yet, okay? Which B squared has to be a perfect square. A and B, I said they could be anything. They actually have to be integers, I guess. Well, I guess they don't, but it's whatever. Uh, and so we can make it work, though. We can make it work. I do notice that at the front of my equation, I have something squared. And up here in the front of my perfect square trinomial, I also have something squared. If A squared is what I want to put here, well, then x squared equals a squared, which means a is just x, okay? And so my goal is now getting a little bit smaller. I want my equation to be x plus something squared, okay? I just need to figure out what this b is. And the way that I'm going to do it is using this center part here, okay? I know that if I want these equations to match, I need 2ab to be equal to my middle term here which is negative 18x, right? Once again, I'm just trying to make my left side of the equation look like this form so that I can simplify it. And so if I want that to be true, I want to match it to what's already in my equation written down. Well, guess what? I know what a was. a is just x. And so 2 times x times b is negative 18x. And so if I want to solve for b, which is what I'm looking for, I just need to divide both sides by 2x. Those cancel. This ends up being this. B equals negative 18 divided by 2 is negative 9. And x divided by x kind of cancels. And so my B value is negative 9. And so in my equation here, I really have x, oops, I was going to do blue, uh, x minus 9 squared. Okay. My goal is so that the left side of this equation, I can rewrite it as x minus 9 squared, okay? But here's the problem. Here's the issue. Well, actually, real quick. By the way, there's a shortcut. You notice that every time I'm just going to be dividing by 2x, that's not a coincidence in these problems. You'll end up finding that b is just the mid half of the middle value, okay? So there you go. There's that. Anyway, 
I want the left side to be this. But the last problem is, if I multiply this out completely, if I took this thing and multiplied it out, I know at the end I'm going to end up with b squared, which is negative 9 squared. Negative 9 squared is 81, which isn't 74, okay? So here's where we're at. Now we're ready to actually start solving this equation. I'm going to rewrite the, the thing that I was given. Equals negative 6, okay? I want this b value at the end, the c, or sort of the last term right here, to be b squared. That's negative 9 squared, okay? Uh, this a and b, once again, don't come from standard form. They just come from this sort of example. 9 squared is not 74. 9 squared is 81. So what do I have to add to both sides to make this 81? Well, I have to add 7 to both sides. And so I'm going to add 7 to both sides. And then I get this, x squared minus 18x plus 81 equals negative 6 plus 7 is 1. Now, this form of the equation is this form of the equation, which with the correct numbers plugged in, is just this. And so I'm going to substitute this in for x minus 9 squared equals 1. And now, to solve for x, all I have to do is take the square root of both sides. Those cancel because something squared under a square root goes away x minus 9 equals plus or minus the square root of 1. Because there's two ways to multiply two numbers together to be 1, it could be positive 1 times positive 1 or negative 1 times negative 1. Then I split this into two different equations because that's what it is, really two equations in one. And I get x minus 9 equals positive 1 and x minus 9 equals negative 1. And then to solve for x entirely, I just need to add 9 to both sides. And I get x equals 10 and x equals 8. All right. Uh, there we go. Very nice. Uh, that's how you complete the square. I think this one was actually factorable. Uh, it turns out some of them are, might be. So yeah. Okay. Factoring. I think we've practiced this enough. Hopefully you can do it. Remember, a times c on the top, b on the bottom, then take these two terms, put them in the area model here and here, while 3x squared and 6 go here, uh, and then you can figure out these two edges, and then you're actually solving for when x is 0. I'm a little short on time, so I got I to gotta cut this a little short, okay? I think I did this in, an, in another video. I'll post my old one as well. Or you can go through my YouTube channel and find my old one. It's called Module 1 Topic 1 Review, Algebra 2. Anyway. The quadratic formula might be a good thing to write down on your note card. Uh, it goes like this. x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, where a, b, and c are the coefficients from the standard form equation, kind of like we were used to uh, at the beginning of the, the review. Okay. If you end up getting an imaginary component of your quadratic formula like this, uh, this one will be imaginary. What I want you to do is just simplify it as much as you can. Simplify as much as you can. Your calculator might give you an error when you type it in. And so basically what that means is, I'll just set this one up and we can do it. x equals negative 2, because b is 2, and then plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's 2 squared, minus 4 times 7 times 8 all over 2 times 7, 2a. Okay? So then you end up getting something like this, where you get x equals negative 2 plus or minus the square root of this whole thing, which if you type it into the calculator, I believe you get negative 220? Let me see if I did my math right in my head. So it's 4 times 7 times 8 is, okay, can we like not have a, can I not have the AI overview? Like, can I just have the calculator when I go to Google it, please? We've, we've gone too far as a society. If I just type in 4 times 7 times 8 and I get AI overview. Yeah, it's 4 minus 224 and then over 14. That's x equals plus negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 
220, negative 220, okay, uh, over 14, okay. Uh, and I'm going to actually show a couple of things on like how to simplify these square roots. Okay, so if I want to break down the square root of negative 220, I want to find the largest perfect square that's a factor of 220, okay? First of all, I'm going to do this on the side. So I'm going to make this a side note. Uh, if I'm trying to break this down, negative square root of 220, 220. Uh, first of all, this negative is just negative 1 times 220, right? I could rewrite this like this, okay? Which, anytime you have two things multiplied inside of square root, you could also just do them on separate square roots as well. So this could be this. Oh, I keep writing 200, 220, okay? Uh, the square root of negative 1 is i, right? The imaginary number. And so really, this is i times the square root of 220. Then, to break down this square root, we want to find the largest perfect square factor, okay? Your, your perfect squares are uh, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, basically 2 times 2, 3 times 3, and so on. That might be a useful thing to write down on your note card as well. Note card. If you have trouble remembering them. Uh, and so I'm just going to take 220 and start dividing it by stuff. I think it, 36 goes into 220. Let's see. So 220 divided by 36. No. 220 divided by 16? Nope. 220 divided by 9. Let's try that one. Nope. What about 64? 220 divided by 64? That's the next one I didn't write. Nope. What about 220 divided by 4? Hey, that works. Uh, 220 divided by 4 is 55. Man, I thought there was a bigger one than that. So this is 4 times 55, right? See that? Square root of 220 is the same as the square root of 4 times 55, because 4 times 55 equals 220. Then the whole reason I chose to do this is I can write it like this again. Square root of 4 times the square root of 55, okay? Square root of 4 is just 2. So i times 2 times the square root of 55. The square root of 55 has no perfect square factors. None of these go into it, and so we can just leave it. Uh, and so really, this becomes 2i times the square root of 55. Big jump, but yeah. So here's where I would be at in this. I would say x equals negative 2 plus or minus the square root of, sorry, plus or minus 2i times the square root of 55 all over 14. This is pretty good, but I think there's one more step we can take. Uh, because I'm dividing by an even number and I have only even things on the top, right? Things are multiplied by 2. I can kind of simplify this fraction out. This is kind of 2 over 14, which is the same as 1 over 7. And since everything on the top is divisible by 2, I can sort of split up these fractions and then recombine them. And so this becomes my final answer that I'm going to have, which is just take these, divide them by 2, and take these, divide them by 2. Divide everything by 2. That's a legal thing as long as you apply it to everything. So x equals negative 1 plus or minus i times the square root of 55 over 7. Okay, these are both pretty good answers. This one is the most accurate we can get. Uh, and so yeah, I would recommend doing it like that. So that's simplify as much as you can. Okay, this one, plug in a, b, and c, and calculate in whatever way you like. However you like. That's what I'll say for this one, okay? Okay, last but not least, let's talk about these imaginary numbers we just kind of did. The big idea here, these ones kind of were just what we did. Uh, if I have no perfect square factors, like 30 doesn't, 4 doesn't go into it, 9 doesn't go into it, 16 doesn't go into it, uh, and then my numbers are too big, then all I can really write is that this is the square root of 30 times i. So i square root of 30, or square root of 30, i. This one... I can rewrite as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 81. The square root of negative 1 is i, and the square root of 81 is 9. And so really, this is 9i. This one simplifies nicely because 81 is a perfect square.
Okay, then for these last ones, we can only combine real terms together and imaginary terms together. So really it's kind of just adding up like you would add variables. You can kind of think of i as a variable. And then for these ones, you can almost think about i as a variable, except when you distribute, you end up getting i times i. So let's do this one, e on the bottom, okay? I have something on the outside, I have to distribute it in. Uh, in the next one, you'll have to double distribute. I'm just gonna multiply this out. So four times two is eight, and then there was an i here, so there has to be an i here. And then four times three, or four times negative three, is minus 12, and then i times i is i squared, okay? Well, i squared is kind of weird, because remember, i is the square root of negative one. And so if I square it, that means I end up getting this thing happening, where I have a square root being squared. Like we saw earlier in the completing square one, those are opposites. And so this cancels out, and you end up with just negative one, which means that this answer is actually this, 8i minus 12 times negative one. Well, negative 12 times negative one is actually positive 12. And so it ends up being 8i plus 12. And then if you wanna write it in super cool form, the complex number form, you'd write 12 plus 8i, like that. Okay, so there's a couple of facts that you might wanna write down in your note card. Maybe some side note like this, like how to break down perfect squares, your perfect squares. I squared equals negative one is a good thing. The quadratic formula is a good thing to write on your note card. Uh, and then maybe any examples that you like, but personally I like to just keep notes. Okay, uh, I think I'm late. So uh, anyway, thanks for watching uh, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Hopefully I was recording. That would suck if I wasn't. Oh, I am.